This morning, we have Professor Simon Noble, who will be chair, and Dr. Razak Ali Khan, who will be bring, um, joining the discussion after the presentation. But first up, I am very pleased to welcome Hugh Rousewell. He is a consultant nurse and thrombosis at the University Hospital Plymouth, and is vice chair of clinical leaders of thrombosis and trustee of the British Society of Hematology. Hugh has responsibility for investigating hospital acquired VTE, giving real time feedback to clinicians. Having completed his MSc with a dissertation on VTE in cardiac surgery, comparing emergency with elective patients, he has published many articles on VTE outcome data. He is also the UK representative for the All China Nursing VTE Alliance and was appointed the hospital VTE lead and chair of the thrombosis committee in Plymouth in 2020. So Hugh, a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for that kind introduction. As I say, yes, I'm here today to, to talk to you about thrombosis management within oncology patients. So an kind of overview, looking at basically what is the history? Why do cancer patients have this risk of thrombosis? What is it about them that increases the risk, both the disease process as well as the treatments we give to them? What is the impact of the thrombosis among this patient group? Looking at some of the trials that have been published more recently, looking at the changes that we've been able to make in terms of how we now treat these patients. And finally, looking at some, starting with some local data from Plymouth and comparing that to how that compares to both national and international data in terms of cancer and, and the risk associated with that. So back to the beginning. So we, we always, all of this stuff is obviously new, but I think it's really important to be very aware this isn't particularly new. I'm a trust who described this way back in 1865. He, discuss, he discussed Trosso syndrome, which he sadly then died of it, which is a rare form of cancer and, and, and thrombosis. So I think it's really important. We, we all think that this is something that's new and we all worry about the treatments for it. But actually, you think 1865, that, that was a long time ago. We were, we were very aware that cancer had this risk of thrombosis. And you think, wow, 1865? Huh. Bullard said this, I'm sure we've all read this article from the Archive of General Medicine from 1823, when John Baptiste Bulliard talked about the risk of cancer and thrombosis. Uh, probably better to translate that, the obliteration of the vein and dropsy, which is an old term for swelling of soft tissues. So I think right from the very beginning, none of this is new. This, this isn't new stuff. And this is nearly 200 years ago, we were, we were talking about cancer and BTE. So, while a lot of the stuff obviously here is more up to date, but it's just really worth bearing in mind. This is something we've known about for a very, very long time. So, so why do cancer patients have a risk of thrombosis? There are, there's a hypothetical state in cancer. There are several mechanisms involved and it's the cancer cells, the host cells, and involves the, the coagulation system. And, and they, they all play a role in the tissue factor. They play a role in procoagulant production, and release cytogenic. So there's lots of reasons, lots of interactions between these cells and the disease process as to why these patients have this increased risk of thrombosis associated with, with this disease. And this kind of tries to explain it in kind of better, better picture, looking at the tumor cells and how they activate coagulation, how clots formed and what's involved. And there are lots of articles and lots of issues around the cancer the why these patients will develop this thrombotic events. Um, and what is it? So we know that lots of things is not purely and simply the, the cancer itself, also in terms of how we treat that, whether that's the medications we use, both hormone therapy, chemotherapy, whether there's surgery that we're giving them for part of it. We often put upper arms, upper lines into the upper arm in order to give medication. And we know that about 80% of all our upper arm thrombosis are probably associated with line. Now clearly not all, not all of those are cancer patients, but we know that putting a line in upper arm increases the risk of thrombosis. We know that chemotherapy causes problems in terms of endothelial damage. It causes problems, it releases procoagulant factors. So there's lots of stuff we're doing that clearly we have to do to reduce the risk and to treat the problem. But part of that treatment, unfortunately, does increase the risk of thrombosis within these patients. Uh, and just to break it down, that what, are, what are the risk factors? And these are the kind of what we look at. I think one of the important things, so it breaks down to the cancer itself, how we treat the patient, particularly, say, the medications that we use, whether we have to give chemotherapy, surgery, 
But I think it's really important to also bear in mind, it's not purely and simply the cancer. They also have the additional risk factors that every patient has for thrombosis. They're still going to be a lot of advancing age, may still have a medical comorbidity, maybe a prior or family history. There are all various reasons why patients develop thrombosis anyway. And the cancer, if you like, an additional factor, which I guess is why not all cancer patients have the same risk of thrombosis, particularly it will, may also depend partly upon what are the risk factors do they have. I think it's really important to bear in mind it is different. Not every patient is the same, even if they have the same disease, the same treatment, they may well have additional risk factors. We know the one in a thousand is we talk about, but obviously this will impact upon what happens next and how likely they are to develop a problem. Not only do they have a problem in terms of a higher risk of thrombosis, at the clot they actually develop is also different. They actually have a different clot. These three slides show basically a normal individual with a clot and the different types of adenocarcinoma and what the clots look like. So it, it's kind of more basic. It's not purely and simply they develop a clot. The clot they develop are also different as well. And thank, um, Kieran, Paul, Kieran's actually showing that slide with me. Um, so what are the risks for it? We know that obviously the biggest risk of death in cancer patients is obviously the primary reason, but actually thrombosis is probably the second most common cause of death within these patients. We know they have an increased risk of thrombosis compared to the general population. We know the incidence is highest, particularly in the first few months after diagnosis, that they have a higher risk of thrombosis. And about, the figures talk about 20 to 30% of all VTEs are cancer associated. Now, our chair today, Dr. No Professor Noble, sorry, has written Pelican Study, where we, we talked about what are patients told in terms of the risk. And I think there's still probably work to be done. I think it's still a jet variable field. It's how much people are aware when they start this process of the risk and what to be aware of. I still think there's work to be done there, but it's really important that patients are told that just because you get a side effect, it might not be the cancer, there's maybe something else we can treat. I think it's really important that that's highlighted. Uh, and chemotherapy, as we know, will also increase the risk of, of thrombosis. Um, it looks at risk of recurrence, but not, not just recurrence, it also gives a risk of bleeding. Now, clearly we know if there's bleeding associated with the treatment, this will have a huge impact on the treatment. It may delay chemotherapy, it may delay surgery one to do. So it's really important that we, we are aware that there is this risk associated with this prognosis. Um, these are the four cancers that are seen to be the highest risk of BCE. Interesting, it's worth, worth bearing those in mind. It'll come some data subsequently looked at what do what cancers do we see in terms of the risk of VTE for them. Um, and chemotherapy is thought to be about, about 10 to 11% of patients with chemotherapy may well develop a thrombosis. Now again, a number of those may well be upper arm thrombosis because we know we, we put lines in them and we know this, this does give them a risk of VTE. And as I say, we do know that the vast majority of upper arm are associated with a line. And interestingly, with DVTs, we worry a lot about post thrombotic syndrome and how can we prevent it? Of course, we, we still, jury still out on compression hosiery. Unfortunately, the study, I think, has been paused that may have given us the answer, but actually there is a registry that suggests active cancer is also an independent risk factor for, for um, post thrombotic syndrome. This goes back, this is just looking at what, are, what cancers are seen to be the most thrombogenic. And I think it shows interesting to note here that um, breast and prostate particularly, in theory, are relatively low risks, pancreas, brain, and much higher. So it's interesting to know that not, not all cancers have the same risks associated with them. There, there are differences within what the cancer is, and also metastases will also play a part in terms of how likely patients are to develop thrombosis. Um, this is a result slide, but I think that, that this shows you that actually the risk for developing thrombosis in cancer patients does increase compared to a control population. Well, that's partly because we've got much better at treating cancer, so therefore patients are living longer, so therefore that there are the complications that maybe historically didn't happen are now happening because they're living longer, but it is certainly something to be aware of that there is this increased risk within this population group of developing a thrombotic event. Um, so yeah, what are, the, what are the consequences? Not surprisingly, an increased mortality and morbidity are associated with it. Um, there's a, the recurrence risk, which we know is going to be greater. There are risks of bleeding complications, which as I said before, will impact upon 
what we do in terms of how we treat these patients and it will delay and the big one which everything comes back to in the end that there's a cost there's a huge cost implication of treating this Interesting, when we started collecting data in Plymouth back in 2010 one of the things we were interested in is looking at mortality and thrombosis and we compared three groups the community acquired group hospital acquired and incidental findings where incidental where basically we've had often staging CTs for cancer but actually found a thrombosis by accident and I think it was like 80% of the, of the incidental was dead within 12 months, 30% of the hospital acquired was it, and only about 12% of community acquired. So even in terms of where we diagnose the clot has a huge implication of, of what happens next in terms of what is the risk and what is the mortality for these patients. There are some trials now, the doxaban is the Hukusaki trial, which was about 500 patients within each group. And all of them were looking really at recurrence versus major bleeding. They were seen non-inferior, which they showed outside of some upper GI cancers. Interestingly, the Husaki, there, one of their contraindications was more than 72 hours of low they were, they were They couldn't take part in the trial. And, they, and one of the problems we often have, particularly in Plymouth, is often we we'll often start using a DOA, or using sorry, lomaheparin for a while before we switch. And actually they, they, they weren't covered in this trial. Similarly, SELECT-D, which is with Roxaban, a much smaller trial, only sort of 200 patients in each arm. As before, looking at recurrence and bleeding, similar findings, non-inferior outside of some of the GI cancers. And again, they actually, they, their, their trial said you couldn't be pre, no previous BTE and any previous dose of anticoagulation. And that again, again, there were some patients that were excluded. So some of our patients that we talk about in Plymouth would not be able to take part within this trial. And finally, the Caravaggio, which is the Pixaban trial, non-inferior, about 600 patients in each arm. Similar findings, though, probably there might be some thought it's, there's less bleeding seen, so it might be safer to use this. Um, and all Caravaggio, they excluded basal, basal cell, brain, and any cerebral mets, and any lemaheparin for more than three days was excluded from their trial. So again, there were certain patients that we probably treat that wouldn't have been included within this trial. So looking at Plymouth, this is basically what we've collected. We've collected data since 2010, but actually only really 2015, we've got the sort of complete data, not only on what we've seen, but also how we treat these patients. It's a retrospective study. So we basically use the radiology records. That's the target investigations, so Doppler ultrasounds, BQ scans, CTPA. We look at them, were they positive? If they're positive, were they hospital acquired? sure we all know, either within 90 days of a discharge or this is hospital and it's occurred under our watch during our stay that the clots happened. We then basically, for, for the hospital acquired, obviously a bit more investigation. We look really, did, did we do everything we should? Did we get every all preventing clots done properly? For the community acquired, which is a large, much larger group, looking at what are the risk factors, what have they got? And for all of them, how do we treat them? What medication did we use to treat them? Um, this is looking over the last sort of seven years in terms of how many patients and, and pretty similar findings year on year in terms of a percentage. 2017, for some reason, seems to have a few more, but otherwise generally almost identical percentage year on year and how many patients had cancer as a risk factor. One of these, interestingly, kind of slightly away from cancer is last year we had this huge increase in total BTE and particularly PE probably a lot to do with COVID, respiratory virus, we knew people were shielding, but we did set nearly 30% more VT events last year. We seem to now kind of calm down again, but it's interesting, even, but even despite that, in terms of cancer, it didn't really change the detail in terms of how many of them had cancer. Um, we also compared to, was there a difference? Were the community acquired patients at more risk or lower risk than hospital acquired? And probably not surprisingly, for the community acquired events, they were, there was a smaller incident of cancer seen with them at 20% of community acquired, compared to nearly a third of all the hospital acquired had a VTE. There's a significant association for cancer for hospital acquired over community acquired. And we also know that from that hospital acquired work, there's generally always a, a significant association for PE over DVT for all our hospital acquired patients. Um, just to look at that, how our data compares, there's three international studies, one from Norway, about 5,000 patients, 22.5% had cancer, similar to what we've seen, um, more PEs and DVTs, so again, pretty similar to what we've seen. And in Sweden, 1.5 million, 
patients had um, DTE, 20%, again, similar numbers, though a few more PE than DBT. And finally, the data from the United States from Oklahoma County, about 22%. So in terms of what we see in Plymouth, it, I guess, I don't know if reassuring is the word, but it's nice to see that what we're seeing in Plymouth is pretty similar to what's being picked up across the world in, in other studies. Uh, this is looking at were they DVT, were they PE, and were they metastatic? And uh, again, generally much more likely to be a PE than a DVT, and that's every year we've done this. Metastatic are kind of smaller numbers. We're seeing a lot more, but a lot more PEs than DVTs. A significant association for PE over DVT for cancer associated thrombosis. And, and again, the, the paper studies before suggested there were an increase. So I don't think quite as much as we're seeing, there weren't the sort of same numbers that we're seeing here in Plymouth, but it certainly it does suggest that they're much more likely to present with a PE over DVT. I guess it's worth pointing out that if we scan a patient and diagnose them with a PE, we certainly wouldn't then start looking for a DVT. So it's, it's immediately possible that some of these PE patients did also have a DVT. We just haven't diagnosed it. It doesn't change treatment, so there's no real reason to get further investigation for them. Uh, and the cancer, I know we talked about before, which cancers were more likely to be seen within with a um, BT event. These are the four most likely, and over half of all our cancer-associated VTE had one of these risk factors, lung with the biggest, breast cancer second, then bowel and prostate. And interestingly, I know we talked before that, for instance, breast cancer, in theory, is a relatively low risk for thrombosis. And I know in Plymouth, we see about 600 cases a year of breast cancer diagnosed. So I suppose over this period of time, it's not a huge number. And I guess it's more reflective of the fact that we just see a lot of breast cancer rather than the cancer itself being particularly um, thrombogenic. But it's just interesting to note that it does, isn't quite the same as you might expect from the figures. And if we just go back to as we talked about before, this is looking at which of the cancers are more likely to present with a thrombosis. As you can see, breast particularly, it seems to be pretty low. But I think it's more of actual numbers rather than individual risk, I think probably explains why there is quite a difference in what we're seeing and what's expected to see. How do we treat them? So this is basically looking at the entire time we've treated these patients over the sort of seven years, a lot more lomalic heparin, a lot less use of DOAX, a little bit of warfarin, and the bottom of the nun or the IVC obviously depends upon whether there's a bleeding risk, it also, the nun, maybe some of the patients are diagnosed relatively late on in the disease process. At the time we found this thrombosis, unfortunately, it's very late on and, and unfortunately they, they don't, they die not long after. Some also choose not to have treatment for whatever reason, but it's a small number. But I think overall, as you see, this is where we are. Now, probably more interesting to know is what's changed. 2015 obviously predated all the trials we talked about before. So what have we done? How, how have things changed? If we look at the most recent to the oldest data, what you expect to see, a lot less labelin of heparin being used, a lot more DOAC use. Interesting, even though back in 2015, we didn't really have the data to support DOAC use in cancer patients, still river oxidant was still being nearly a quarter of all our BTEs. Even then, we were still using river oxidant. Small numbers of warfarin. And this data comes from either if they're, if they're not admitted, this is what they're outpatient treated on, or if they're diagnosed as an inpatient, what medication we, we're using on discharge. Now, again, some of these may change down the line once we've given a few months treatment. And it's often a shared decision who makes the decision. It's a, sometimes it's oncology, sometimes it's hematology. There are differences depending upon who, who sees, who, who does this. Uh, and, looking at, and looking at how that compares to every VT, so this is every single VTE, obviously not just cancer patients, a lot less lemon heparin, they're going to a lot of those are pregnancy, IBDU patients, um, DOAC failures, and some patients choose to, or short term, you're waiting for something, a lot more rivaroxaban and apixaban, and small numbers of warfarin. 
Interestingly, in Plymouth, for some reason, we seem to use a lot of rivaroxaban for our DVT patients, and a lot of pixaban for our PE. I'm not entirely sure why. It, it's possible that for the DVT patients, it's often the, the primary care that starts it while they're waiting the scan, and PE starts in hospital. Maybe that makes a difference. It, it's not clear, but it's interesting to note that we have this difference between these, these two medications. And again, looking at a couple of international studies, how do we treat VTE? In Israel, so over 15,000 patients, a, generally a lot of them were you know, heparin, a small number on DOAX. But again, if you look at it more, the more recent data, there has been a change and over a quarter of patients now are being treated with DOAX and that's only going to change going forward. A Japanese study which looked at under 7,000 patients, a lot of adoxaban, we haven't, I didn't really mention that, but actually we don't use a lot of adoxaban in VTE. Only the, the one patient group who really love it and actually what we often switch to are our intravenous drug users because they don't like BD drugs, they don't like eating, but they love it once daily without food. So they're the patient, it's probably not a selling point, but they, they definitely do like that drug and they use it. And I also learned, I don't know if I knew this, that Lomaheptin is not licensed in Japan to treat VTE. I don't know if you knew, I certainly didn't know that before today. So if nothing else, you learned one thing today. Um, and what did I say? NICE have sort of talked about what we do in terms of treating thrombosis. They do say that we can consider looking at using DOAX, taking into account bleed risk, the cancer type, and what we do, and can consider treatment. Clearly, there's still a need for low heparin and even vitamin K antagonists. But they do note that a lot of these drugs were off license, particularly as the trials have come through. Interestingly, I was at a meeting recently, and one of the things that was discussed was the upper arm thrombosis. And of course, we, like many centers, use DOAX for that. And actually, it's the same issue. They're actually off license. And in theory, we shouldn't be using them. But I say the vast majority of our upper arm thrombosis, that, that, that's what we're using for them. Um, so what do we know? So over the seven years, about 1,300 patients developed the thrombosis associated with cancer. So about 20% of all our VT events, but actually, we look particularly at the hospital acquired events, then actually nearly a third of those actually developed a thrombosis. About 20% had metastatic cancer. The only risk factors really that were greater than active cancer were advanced age over 60 and a significant medical problem. Most of the risk factors were similar or, or sort of lower. So it's clearly one of the big risk factors we need to be aware of. These are the four um, cancers that have a risk of thrombosis. I know lung was seen it. The other three, particularly in theory, you wouldn't think would be particularly thrombogenic, but over, yeah, over half of all our events had those as their primary diagnosis. We are seeing a lot more use of DOAC in cancer patients, which is probably something that's not unique to Plymouth, and the, the trial seems to suggest that that is the case going forward uh, and probably will continue to do so. So I will leave you a nice picture of a nice beach in Newquay to look forward to. Probably not, not that nice there today because it's, it's winding and howling down here today, but nice name. But thank you for your time. And I think we're now over to questions. Thank you very much, Hugh. And I apologise for being late and unable to um, introduce you. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, do you think you'd be able to remove your slides, especially since you're showing a photo of Cornwall and not Devon? Um, of course, you do have to go over the Tamar Bridge to be able to take a photo of something pretty from where you live. So um, I'm absolutely fine with that. Um, so I would like to now, um, first of all, thank and welcome Hugh. Um, Plymouth has been um, a healthcare organisation which has always taken thrombosis and hospital acquired thrombosis very seriously. Um, you know, back from when Tim Noakes was championing it as well with you, Hugh. So um, you're very welcome and really lovely to see that cat data and to see that, you know, the sort of patients that we are seeing in a UK NHS environment is similar to that shown by all the large epidemiological studies. So it does tell us that, you know, we, we, we're kind of what we're seeing is very much representative. Um, what I'd like to do is also introduce now um, a friend and colleague of mine, um, Professor Raza Alakan, um, who's an honorary professor and consultant haematologist at Cardiff and the Vale University Health Board. Um, 
Raz and I actually um, work closely together with the Cancer Associated Thrombosis Service, which serves Southeast Wales. And um, the great thing is we've got a lot of time allocated just to discuss issues about learning, implementation, approach to service modelling. So that's what the bulk of what we're going to be talking about. But also it does allow us time as well to discuss any questions which come up. And um, so, first of all, I mean, I would just like to ask um, Hugh, the management of cancer associated thrombosis in your health authority and trust, is it, is CAT managed separately or is it managed as part of the thrombosis service there? No, it's not managed separately. I know obviously we had the had a presentation at Clock last week from Kieran, I'm sure you know very well. And there's a couple of places and Bath are doing this. And it's something that's very interesting. It's probably worth it. It's not. It's kind of unfortunate that it's it's very much a variable feast, depending upon where they present and what they present with as to who manages them. Because it's often a shared decision between oncology and hematology. And there are some issues I think we probably would be a good thing, but the problem is I guess anything, isn't it? It's setting that up. I appreciate it's a really great service, but with with kind of time and money if everything comes back to sadly but no it, it's not separate though. I think it's a really good plan I know think here in data it probably would work much better because I'd say that even the clocks are different they are they are a different population to our, our normal our normal population even we do the follow-up at six months there it's difficult to know you do they are very different in terms of how you follow them up and what happens after sort of six, three to six months treatment. Thank you I mean I think these are this is one of those things that these things don't happen less they don't happen broadly unless it becomes a standard of care that everyone's expected to do. And I've often said that I think cancer associated thrombosis is a dog which doesn't quite know which <laughs> kennel it's supposed to be in, whether the responsibility lies with the oncologists, with the haematologists, with primary care, the vascular um, so, um, physicians, etc. cetera. Raz, um, do you want to just give a bit of an overview of the CAT service um, that you work on and also I mean, your, your kind of experience of it, because you came into an already established CAT clinic. Yeah, th thank you, Simon. And I think it's interesting hearing, um, you know, Hugh obviously is an expert in the field and yet um, is, is, is struggling um, to, be, to get the support that I, I think the patients in his locality would benefit from. Um, he mentioned that Kieran has presented, and for those that haven't heard Kieran present, Kieran's a pharmacist, um, and and he leads the service there and works closely with with oncologists, and he, I think he works with some of the hematologists as well in Swansea. Um, as you say, I, I was fortunate in that you'd already established a cancer associated thrombosis service in South Wales, so. Uh, you know, I can take no credit. And when when I talk to people at national meetings and they say, oh, "Well, you've got this great service." I inherited it so I, I didn't establish it I'd like to feel that I've contributed to it but I think um, what, one of the key things for me is firstly you need to have people who are interested in it um, th this this shouldn't be something where you write a document or a pathway um, which says cat start DOAC review in six months time it's far more complicated and nuanced. I actually think it's much easier to treat non-cancer patients than, than cancer patients. Um, and that's certainly not um, reducing the complexity of the non-cancer patients that, that we, we, we look after. Um, the, 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 one of the things that you brought in was the multidisciplinary team um, aspect um, and, and also the training aspect for junior doctors. But we, uh, we have pharmacists who, who join um, we have we, we have our colleague Dr. Dr. Nicky Pease, um, who, who who runs it from the cancer centre. So I think firstly you need to have interested parties. Um, I think you need to have people who understand what they're doing, and I think in, I think I think regional MDTs are very helpful. Um, we're very we're very used to regional MDTs in cancer management now. Um, you don't have to have experts in every hospital. You can link in to your regional services and. One of the things that I think, uh, one of the things I think that you you brought in right at the beginning, was that patients were started on low molecular weight heparin, um, and then we review those patients around the day thirty mark. We, the majority of the patients that you and I see, it was very interesting looking at Hughes Hughes data about exclusion criteria from the trials. 
Um, you, you, you know, when we look at the trial data, I think you've got some very interesting data that you've looked at in terms of the, the River Oxfam Select study, um, in terms of uh, you know, some 2,000 patients were screened. Um, less than a half of those patients uh, were, were approached or, or fulfilled the inclusion criteria. And from that 1,000 patients, that was still then whistled down to maybe 400 patients. So um, I, I can remember when, when I inherited the clinic from you, it was sort of presented to me as, could I come in for a year or two, steady it, um, and then hand it over to um, a, a specialist healthcare prof professional who would prescribe the DOAX? Um, I think that's how it was sold to me. Could I teach them how to prescribe DOAX? And, and what was what's become very clear to me is that less than half of the patients that we see each week are actually suitable for a DOAC. Um, they, they wouldn't have got into any of the trials, uh, you know, Hokusai, Select D or Caravaggio. Um, I don't know if you find that, Hugh, when, when, you're, when you're reviewing your patients. So this sort of reflex of you can put them onto a DOAC because the trials have been published. Do the patients actually fulfil any of those criteria? No, I did try and look and see how many of the patients. I, I only looked at last year's data. Certainly the, the biggest one, Select D, with previous VTE, there, there were at least nine patients that wouldn't have gone in because they've had previous VTE. A lot of the stuff, even in terms of being on liver heparin, because they often will start on it for several days and a lot of the trials would have excluded them. So they, in theory, they wouldn't have done, but there is this idea that it seems to be safe for all, isn't it? That it does seem to be, and it's... But we also see the opposite. We obviously see patients, we see patients three to six months who've been on low heparin the whole time. And actually you kind of, and there's no real reason to stay on that because they've, nobody's followed it up. One of the things I don't know, interesting question for you, one of the ways we're trying to establish, one of the things that I know is the British Society Society are really keen to do with all new PE is, is this kind of follow-up after seven days. We're trying to understand that way kind of everything, kind of get funding to do it because there's, there's, nobody wants to be involved. And I think that'd be, that'd be a really useful thing for all PE. And we don't currently do that. I don't know, do, you, do, any, do any of you do that currently? So, sorry. That, yeah, yeah. So it was just, I happened to be speaking to the guys who wrote that last week. We just happened to be in a, on, a, on, a, on a meeting. And, and I asked that particular question. Um, it was put into their quality standards. So the 2018 ambulatory PE pathway yeah. um, and then the 2020 um, standards. Um, a lot of centres struggle with that seven day. I think if you're mm. using a Pixaban and you've already got something built in where you're doing a day seven review, then that works. Um, I think for some centres that were using River Oxfam, they were doing a, 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 a day 21 review. Um, but but the BTS are keen to to promote that as a quality standard, um, and I think it, it 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 does have some scope in terms of um, patients who have questions and um, an opportunity to answer them. And it, it, you're right, I've never actually thought of it this way, but it could support CAT in that you could review the patients after they'd had a week of low molecular weight heparin. You'd have time to work out what chemo they're on. Um, you know what their platelet counts are doing, etc. So it's not a bad. I don't think it's a bad idea. I mean, Simon and I tend to review patients in the first thirty days, um, but we don't set. A, a, I mean, Simon, you, you see patients outside of our MDT yeah. as well. I mean, I think the the thirty days is was a pragmatic one. That when the CAT service was first set up, it was me on my own, um, and in fact, to be allowed to use it. I was even using my own R&D money to pay for the clinic space. Yeah. So I was actually paying for the privilege of providing a service, which I've forgotten how many tens of thousands or maybe a hundred thousand pounds a year are saving the authorities by managing, um, managing a shared care agreement, which allowed GPs or invited GPs to take on the prescribing um, thereby they wouldn't be paying VAT. So we were actually, in, in our health boards, which are financially linked to primary and tertiary secondary care, um, we were basically taking 20% off our drug costs of three, 400 new cat patients a year. So we were saving a lot of money by using this system. But when you're someone on your own to actually manage the referrals and see the patient safely, it was like, well, if I can only see them at one point, I will see them at the 28, 30 day period where we normally will decrease the um, delta pyrin as we used it would decrease the dose. So it's a purely pragmatic point that that was when a clinical decision was going to be made. As we are using more and more DOACs, and actually that first appointment, one of the things that we're really thinking is, 
can we switch this person to a DOAC, that could be brought forward if you had a more robust system of getting people in straight away. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to benefit the patients because they're going to have an opportunity for their questions to be answered because often the diagnostic process is rushed and they don't get much information at all. Number two, it's going to save money because um, low molecular weight heparins are more expensive than the DOACs. So you're actually going to save your organization a fair bit of money if that's the model, but you're still maintaining safety. And the thing that we have chosen to do, uh, much to the chagrin of some of our colleagues, is say, if you know, put them on low molecular weight heparin and refer. Now, some people say, yeah, look, we know what we're doing. But I still remember the first email letter I got from a well-respected senior oncologist who specialised in upper GI cancers and said, dear Simon, now that the um, now that um, Select D is reported, when can I start using um, Rivaroxaban on all my patients? I'm sure it would enhance their quality of life. Now, my response was, well, if their quality of life is enhanced by admission to hospital and endoscopies, I'm sure it will. But I mean, so that's what we're dealing with. Now, I would say the upside of it is, is that our oncologists are, you know, <coughs> managing loads and loads of patients with new agents, new complications. And thrombosis is just one of those complications that they have to manage. But that is becoming more complex. And so I, I think it's fair that we take that on. Um, but from a safety perspective, we would always say as a default, go with low molecular weight heparin, and then let's look at the ones which we can safely give. Because as Raz said, 50% of the patients we are seeing would not get, would not have got into those studies. And I think 60% of the patients we review in the CAT clinic, we are managing completely outside the evidence. And that's what really struck me was that the benefit of an MDT decision-making is that you know, you go to the clinical guidelines and, you know, I've sat on more than I'd like to admit to. Um, but actually, if you were to get one of those clinical guidelines out and read and say, how do I address this patient? 60% of the patients we've got, it won't help us. So to actually have several minds together and a multidisciplinary approach actually protects us every time we go off license which is 60% of the time we've got a body of our peers who would all come to the same condition. Raz, do you want to share a little bit about how decision-making sometimes varies and actually the, the richness of that MDT? Because I think this is where we can really learn something. This is the bit I love about the MDT. So I, I come from a background of, you know, acute medicine. Um, you know, I've spent 20 years trying to, further the development of anticoagulants i don't want to say no acts or new anticoagulants but you know new parenterals new orals trying to find the holy grail of the of the the anticoagulant that doesn't cause bleeding so um I, I, you know if you have a clot treat it that, that was my mantra when i first started working in the cat clinic and for me the education is you know it, you, you don't always have to treat everything um uh, you know um that that's been one of the things um the patient's quality of life is extremely important but the patients also we have to remember when we're recruiting patients into these studies the attrition rate um, in some of the cat studies that i've been involved in has been about 50 percent which, which means that half of your patients die during the trial and for me um, treating DVTs and PEs in non-cancer patients i i found that very very sobering and surprising and and in our clinics we're not just talking about treating a clot or trying to prevent its 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 reoccurrence we're trying to manage patients symptoms and quality of life and so simon and, and our colleague nikki will um educate me frequently on the fact that we don't have to treat all clots and um sometimes when you switch a patient from an injection to a tablet um the, the patient's prognosis and uh, the disease progression actually facilitates stopping treatment. Whereas if you prescribe an anticoagulant, which is an injectable and a nurse is coming to the house daily for six months, even when the patient's moribund, they carry on with that low molecular weight heparin injection. It's, 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 very, it's a very different model of care 
I found to, um, to, to non-cancer patients and also the dosing as well. Um, you know, Simon touched on the fact that um, a lot of what we do is outside of the, the license. Um, you know, particularly when we're talking about dose, we're always talking about it's not licensed for this, it's not licensed for that. I suspect a lot of what Simon does in palliative care is unlicensed. Um, uh, you know, um, and, and it's all about patient quality, um, the, the care that we're providing them. So that's the education for me is you don't have to treat all clots. Um, but if you do treat them, you shouldn't just give them a prescription and say, come back and see me in six months. These patients become anemic, thrombocytopenic. Their, 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 their chemotherapy changes. I've just had a referral this morning for a prostate cancer patient who I thought was very straightforward. Enzalutamide, let me he's guess. Gone, he's gone on to enzalutamide. Hey. <laughs> so, so, so that's now a drug-drug interaction with his DOAC. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, and Simon knows these cases because it happens weekly. But that team have carried on prescribing the Apixabam. And for me, that's an alarm bell, which is why I do think you need to have the MDT, the expertise or the experience um, uh, to be involved. I, I, I don't think you can just write a protocol and a pathway on how to manage CAT. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I think I think that's important. I was I was I was Hugh, I was interested in your data in that you said you see more PEs. I suspect that's because patients are having lots of imaging. Um, as opposed to symptomatic PEs, I, I, I suspect that's why your, your data is skewed. Um, but with regards to PEs, I think that's it's an important topic in that if you don't treat them or, or patients who do present with PEs, it does have an impact on their mortality rate. But we also know that patients, I think, Simon, what, what do we do when we see a subsegmental PE? I mean, you, do you have any sort of um decision making processes that you follow with subsegmental peas or these small asymptomatic peas um first of all in terms of the PE about the dbt actually we start back in 2010 was the first we ever collected data on bt and literally it was almost identical number of dbt and pe every year since then dbts have pretty much stayed the same and pe's have increased year on year well that's because we, as you say we now have these scanners like every little subsegmental p is picked up and every time we find it we treat it and you do and the frustration is some of the times we're treating it someone's got an obvious pneumonia they've done a ctpa and a tiny subsegmental so i them thinking we did, never did that nothing would have changed that we now we now give them six months you now got the clinic and what do you do because you can't give them lifelong because we found this we, we should never have looked for it we, we certainly do treat all of them i know there was, there was is, there's, a, there's a trial isn't there is, is it looking at this i don't know i know we were an interest in it i don't know how far that's got we did express an interest but COVID put a stop to that for a while. I don't know if that's moved any further forward. But I think it's a really interesting topic. Is what do you do with subsegmental PEs? I think the um, the other thing that is worth considering because I often take the um, I think with the cancer patients, you know, there's a subsegmental PE if it's isolated. We don't know whether the you know there's unlikely to be a survival advantage from anticoagulating it, and let's not forget that anticoagulation brings with it. Um, an independent risk of major bleeding in a percent, you know, two and a half, three and a half percent, percent of patients. Now, I often say I'm not afraid of the baby bear that I can see on the CTPA, but um, it's the mama bear that's coming after it. And so that clot may have come from somewhere. So I would want to look at the legs and see if there are clot there. One thing that we haven't spoken about, and I think it's worth considering here, is... We're very good at starting anticoagulation, but when do we stop it? <laughs> because actually what we're seeing now is that the natural history of cancer is changing. Um, we've got so good at treating cancers. I mean, things like melanoma, you know, I'm seeing people who've had extensive metastatic disease in remission because of these new targeted anti-cancer therapies. I mean, it's amazing what we've seen. And, you know, some of the lung cancers as well, we're seeing massive changes when previously their prognosis would be a matter of months. I mean, I think about 15 years ago, I published a case series of patients with advanced cancer and clots. And the issue of what to do when they reach six months was not, an, not important because they didn't live that long. Whilst now people are living with cancers, which as chronic diseases and receiving systemic anti-cancer therapies for years until that one doesn't work, then we'll find another thing that ends in MIB or MAB or IB, and we'll give that. 
So people are having these things all the way through. So they're on anticoagulants a lot longer. But, you know, it's when you review someone and they're near the end of life and, you know, they, they're sick of the injections or they've had a few bleeds or what should we do? What should we do? Then you go through the notes and you realize that this person's had an isolated subsegmental PE three years ago. You know, for me, size does matter here. The age of the clot matters. And we also know that in the last six months of life, the risk of bleeding in patients with advanced cancer goes up significantly. Tardy and colleagues looked at patients in a, in French hospices and patients who kind of, you know, were there within six, six months of dying. And the bleeding rate was 11.8% of clinically relevant bleeding. And the things that w w it was associated with was history of bleeding, use of antithrombotics and use of anticoagulants. We published a series of patients. It was over 200 patients with cancer associated thrombosis known to our service who died. And of those, over 50 percent had continued their anticoagulant up until the point of death or within seven days of death. Because no one you know, decided to stop it. And the notes documented. So this is retrospective and not everyone's going to write in the notes. This person had a bleed. But um, over 7% of patients had a major bleed documented who were still anticoagulated. So we know that as death approaches, we're better off stopping the anticoagulant because any end of life, any clots they may have near the end of life, we could manage with end of life drugs. So we need to get to a point where we actually think about when are we going to stop this and what would be our criteria for stopping it? So, so Sam, that's a really important point that you make about bleeding because traditionally we teach that particularly in, in cancer thrombosis that um, recurrences and bleeds are, are front loaded um, you see them early in the, in the course of treatment um, they're at least double um, the rates in non-cancer patients in terms of risk of recurrence and bleeds but actually what you're describing is almost a, a sort of u-shape um, in terms of bleed so the risk is high at the beginning it sort of falls down um, it, it then sort of becomes a sort of flat plateau doesn't it and then as you approach that end of life phase I think that's a really important thing to take away is that risk of bleeding there, there is always this fear about if I stop it they're going to have another clot whereas if, if a patient it, it's that it's that sort of fear of harm sort of a natural event or, or 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 a medical event, isn't it? And you know, which, which event are we precipitating? If we if we if we remove a treatment and they have another clot, that's our fault. If they bleed on the treatment, well, it was you know it was advanced cancer. And I think you're absolutely right. Stopping treatments uh, as important as um, initiating it. Um, yeah, I think I think have we just had a couple of questions come through? Sorry, yeah, I, I it's can't gone. tell. Sorry. Yeah, so we've had one here. Let me have a look. So um, I'm from um, I'm from Stoke and have started a dedicated cat service here. Congratulations. Excellent. It is now three months on and we observed exponential rising cat referrals for cat MDT. In your experience, how can we streamline these referrals with your experience? One solution is to see them in the cat clinic instead. Waiting time is three months. What are your suggestions? So um, you're always going to become a victim of your own success. And actually, when. Um, I was doing the cat clinic at Valindra before Raz started. Um, they used to take the mic because I carried a separate phone to manage cat referrals. I was like this sort of um, drug dealer with my cat phone. So what happens is people do get to a point where they switch off their brain and just go cat refer. And um, when you look through them, I think you have to decide what are you prepared to take referrals for and what are you not um because you know yeah, there are certain I mean, things which can have streamlined pathways aren't there as i mean what do you think yeah yeah no i think i think you know um again victim of your own success i when we started we were quiet um and now it's it we could run a cat clinics you know six days a week um certainly in terms of the the calls for advice and emails and stuff and so i think it, particularly if you're if you're a new clinic what you don't want to do is get swamped to the point where you can't actually function so there are 
it, it depends on what you're trying to do. We're, we're trying to, we've got all our patients going on to low molecular weight heparin. And from that, we're trying to identify which patients we can put onto a DOAC, which patients we can give a finite treatment plan. Is it a line associated clot? Are they going to get three months, for example? Um, is, it, is it a pick associated clot? Are we going to manage that slightly different? So you can streamline. Is it, is it somebody that we're not currently using a DOAC in? You know, is it a gastroesophageal junction tumor? Is it an upper GI tumor? We're not using DOACs in those patients. So you could actually streamline um, entry criteria to CAP where you could re review these patients. Because as Simon rightly says, just one, and we're not doing this to save money, but we have to be conscious um, of, of, the, uh, of the environment we work in. If you take one cat patient at, at a month on low molecular weight heparin, that potentially from drug costs, nurse costs can cost thousands of pounds. Whereas if you switch them to a DOAC appropriately, we're then talking about less than a hundred pounds perhaps. So, so there's a huge uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to justify a service in terms of cost avoidance and also funding a service. But you can also streamline out patients who are not appropriate. Firstly, they have to have tissue diagnosis. What you can't have is every patient with a suspicion of a clot. Um, you can have criteria in terms of platelet counts, in terms of hemoglobin, in terms of chemotherapy, you know, prostate patients on enzalutamide, there's no need to refer them to the cat clinic because you're not going to put them on, on, on a pick spam or river oxpam. They're going to stay on the Delta Pyrus. So I think you could to help, you could develop that clinic in that way. Um, the other way is, is to get a pharmacist, get a nurse, get colleagues to, to work with you um, and actually try. You don't have to see every patient. Could you potentially review the cases in an MDT? And then actually give advice and educate your colleagues so that they learn how to manage some of those patients. I would hope that the patient I'm going to refer right back to the team. Hopefully they won't continue prescribing a DOAC in the next patient they see on enzalutamide. So there's an opportunity that you sort of go up and then you stabilise and hopefully you only see the complex stuff um, moving forward. Can I also make... Um... <clears throat> make a, what I believe is a statement of fact, it's, no. whether it's fact or not, it's opinion. But a patient who is seen in a cat clinic and sees a specialist nurse or a specialist pharmacist, I believe is going to get a better service than one who sees the doctor. And that is because they are trained to be more holistic they're trained more to think about psychosocial issues and they're trained more to be thinking about health promotion as well. They are much better at those things. Whilst as doctors, we're very good at going drug, drug interactions. They say you take your medicine, et cetera, but we don't provide the same holistic care. We'd like to, and I'm sure we can, if we really put our effort to it, but the idea of these members of the multidisciplinary team just being cheap doctors to take up the slack is absolute heresy. These guys bring so much to what I what are very complex, distressed, vulnerable adult population. And so one of the reasons that Raz's suggestion is so important is that if your clinics are too busy, you are no longer able to bring to that clinic what is needed, which is actually... Um, an educational supportive environment for a very distressed patient population. Let's not forget these guys are facing their own mortality. They've learned they've got cancer. They're worried that they could be dying. They have now developed what is a complication of their cancer or a complication of their treatment. And when they look that up, they will find that um, very distressing because they'll see that this could be a threat to life. This is a compl complication. You need to be able to address those fears because if you don't, they're going to go on the internet. Um, I personally feel that we should be talking, trying to normalize cat. You know, when you're seeing that, you know, you know, kind of 25% of clots um, are cancer, you know, you know, people who have febrile neutropenia are not so traumatized by it because they've told it's normal and to expect it. I think it's the same with clots now. So therefore, I think, yeah, multi-professional. Um, the other thing is decide, are there certain things that you're not going to, you can just have a pathway for? For example, pick line thrombosis, you know, three months anticoagulation. You know, and you could even say, well, the evidence doesn't, you know, wasn't done in DOEX. These ones are 
three months of low molecular weight heparin. And when people go, look at your drug budget, you go, well, we could save some money if we could use the savings to put into that. Atrial fibrillation, you know, the number of people go, oh, we've got a person who's in, a, in AF they, and they have the audacity of, you know, being on warfarin. What are we going to do? Will you ch- tell us what to do? You know, well, there, there's, there's, there's documents out there telling them what to do. So there are certain things you can say, are we going to see all the patients with superficial thrombophlebitis? You know, those are the ones that you could could weed out. And there are some that you could actually just have a pathway for. Now, yeah, some, some sorry, right. just, just very, very quickly, I just want to yeah. say, I, I, so if, for, for the managers who think getting a pharmacist and a nurse in is all about saving money, that, that's the wrong way to look at it. Totally. What the nurses and the pharmacists bring is actually far more than another professor brings. I'd much rather have a good pharmacist or a good nurse. Um, and we're both in that same boat. And we, you know, my DVT clinic is run by nurses. I have a fantastic pharmacist who I work with. And I, I would say you need to have some clinical input, but that they're the ones that actually de- deliver the, the great services. And that's why that, that, that phrase, the MDT, it's not just something... I learned at medical school it's 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 something that we really use daily um, and I couldn't work without it and in fact if you're running a cat service or a new cat service or you think you're setting up a cat service please don't just set it up thinking about the doctors and the registrars and the SHOs you need please think about the nurse specialists the pharmacists the dietitians, the, the, the healthcare professionals that will make that patient's journey and, and their care far better than yeah. if it's run by a group of doctors or professors now we have three minutes to go. Yeah, My cat clinic started 15 minutes ago, so <laughs> I think we're going to need to wrap this up. Hugh, Jeez. I just thought I'd, I'd like to leave the final words with you. Um, what, what are your take-home messages for those who've dialed in? Yeah, just being aware that, that this, as I say, this is one of, this is a very common risk factor for thrombosis. The treatments are changing, being aware, but also I think going back to don't just focus on the cancer. There are other risk factors to look at. If, get, get, get them more active, get them not dehydrated, get them to stop smoking. There are other stuff that they can do as well as the cancer. It's really important. Don't just focus on that. But actually, it is changing and it's better. But I think, and I think they are right. The cat clinics are great. I, I wish we had one. And it's great to see there's more of them out there. And I think I knew of a couple. In fact, there's, there's more than I know about, which, which is amazing. Thank you. So I'm going to wrap this up now. First of all, I'd like to thank our um, our panel, Hugh. Raz, really appreciate your time and your expertise. I'd like to thank Joe Jerome, who has done the lion's share of organising Let's Talk Clot and all the education, um, you know, and Thrombosis UK and all the trustees and all the guys who work there. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we've got something very special here, a charity that is putting on such high quality education for free, Thank you to all our sponsors. Please go on to that really cool um, avatar-laden <laughs> um, platform. I'm sure if you go on the BSH, I think it looks like, is it Keith Gomez is actually at the, you know, have a look. I think Keith Gomez is sat at the BSH thingy there. I don't know <laughs> if that's real. I thought it was. But um, thanks to everyone. Thanks for your support. Um, you know, stay in touch with Thrombosis UK and we will see um, well, we'll certainly see you in National Thrombosis Week, but there's lots of stuff going on with Thrombosis UK. Raz, you wanted to say something? No, I no. just I just wanted to thank Joe again. I, I mean, she does an amazing job. Thrombosis UK does an amazing job. And thank you for the invitation to join your panel today. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. And please do fill in the feedback because what you are seeing here is as a result of the feedback we've had often we've had cat talks where we've had five minutes of discussion at the end and people said we wanted more time for discussion that's why we have this so please give feedback let us know what you would like because otherwise you're just going to get me rolled out again giving the same old sports and the same elvis slides and people deserve better than that so thank you everyone have a great um great rest of the week cheers <laughs>